Welcome to the Floor Academy podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Hadeen, owner of Illustrious Hardwoods in Mesa, Arizona. With me this week is Russ Harlow, the owner of Reliable Remediation. And we're going to get into talking about core values and why your company really needs to have them, use them, obey them, and use them in in your hiring process and making sure that you find employees with a good fit. We're going to dig into that in just a minute. Uh, I want to take a minute and say, you know, if you're listening to the show, thank you. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. Go on over to the YouTube channel. Subscribe over there. I'd really love to grow that platform a little bit. Uh, if the show's doing anything to help you, check out patreon.com slash floor academy. Even five bucks a month goes a long way in helping the show to continue to be around, you know, and uh, tell a friend for me, you know, and when you're when you're at the supply shop and you're standing in line, tell somebody about Floor Academy, let them know how it's helped your business and how it can help theirs. Lastly, for over 65 years, Latacrete has been a leading manufacturer of products and systems covering tile and stone installation, masonry veneer installation, resinous and decorative floor finishes, concrete construction chemicals, and concrete restoration. They offer an array of low VOC and sustainable products. Their products contribute to LEED certification, exceed commercial and residential VOC building requirements, and are backed by the most comprehensive warranties in the industry. For more information on Latacrete and the products they offer, visit latacrete.com. Russ, welcome to the show. Who are you? What do you do? Why do you do it? Thanks, Kyle. I, want to, I appreciate the opportunity to come on and have a good discussion with you. Um, I appreciate what you do for your listeners. Uh, I, um, I have been working a long time for a lot of different businesses, just kind of paying the bills. And it got tired of feeling like I was the best guy in the building. Not saying I was, just kind of felt like it sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, before I got too old, maybe look into business ownership and hopefully reap some of the rewards of my hard work. And I started looking at a lot of different opportunities. I found myself at a franchise show, which I didn't know existed, where a bunch of franchises get together and they sell you their brand. And I met some franchise uh, coaches who helped brought me some brands to look at. And I searched through 12 or 15 different brands and business models and settled on um, a restoration franchise, a smaller one that I love the culture, love the brand. And during my search process, realized that helping people was more important to me than I realized. And in our business, when people find themselves in times of disaster, you know, floods and fires and things, mm -hmm. um, it, it makes a big difference in, in feeling good and sleeping well at the end of the day. Yeah, that's a that's a tough time when your life is thrown into upheaval because the water heater leaked when you left to go grocery shopping for an hour. It just sucks. Yeah, it doesn't usually leak. It usually lets go. <laughs> yes, that's yes. <laughs> Come back to a quarter inch of water pouring out of your house. Hot water. Yeah. So, okay. Um, and and what was it? What were you doing before you you were looking to find a franchise and decided on remediation? Um, you know, honestly, it was a lot of different jobs. Um, I was in. Uh, transportation, doing delivery for a number of different companies, some of the larger package carriers and um, some local companies. Um, it was, I never really got my self worth from the job that I did. Mm -hmm. uh, it was more about making sure my family was provided for. That's all I really cared about. Uh, and, and I took that same attitude into looking for a business. You know, when I had those franchise advisors, um, you know, I said, I don't care if it's a porta potty business, as long as it's got great margins and, um, you know, that's all it really needs, a good business model. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's how I, I approached it and realized some more things about myself in that process and how we ended up with uh, with the restoration industry. So well, what what did you realize? Like what came as you were like digging in and right self-discovery? So what kind of came about? Um, so like I said, we did, I mean, we looked at a ton of different things like home health care, uh, a tutoring franchise, um, you know, really ran the gamut of things. And as we started whittling it down, we had so many things in front of us. Um, we actually 
put together a decision matrix and we started weighting what things were important, my wife and I, mm -hmm. uh, weighting the things that were important to us. Uh, what did we want the, to get back from the business? What did we want to get out of it? What were the things that were important? We started giving things a number and we started scoring these things and things, the cream started to rise to the top. And, you know, one of those things that we did realize was helping people um, in their time of need was uh, more important to me than I thought it was. When I just thought I needed a good business model, um, <laughs> I realized that helping folks was going to make a big difference and that's something that we wanted to do. It didn't hurt that restoration can be restor um, kind of uh, um, recession resistant because mm -hmm. disasters happen all the time. It's not recession, recession proof. Um, I don't know of anything that really is. So I I'm with you. Okay, so I you, you were identifying things that were important to your own value system without realizing it probably at the time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we kind of walked through those things and had those conversations, tough conversations. Because, you know, we tried to, to make when you've got that much information and you're trying to dive in, it, mm -hmm. you have to do something to sort it out or else it's just going to be analysis paralysis. You can't pull the trigger. You're just like, well, I don't know. I like this. I like this. I like this. Yeah. And we had to find a way to to, to get in there and, and make the good decisions. Boys and gals, th this is huge information here, especially if, so if you're listening and you're thinking of like stepping out from the person you're working for and starting your own thing. This is key advice right here. It's not just about being able to like make the widget and install the floor, install the shower, whatever it is that you're doing. Analyze this bigger situation that's going on of what it's going to look like to have a company and figure out what matters to you and why you want to do what you're going to go do. Just because you have the skill set to be successful at building a shower or installing that floor doesn't mean you have that back end skill set to run the business. And I, I think that's what you were kind of going through, right? Like I, as a fra buying a franchise, they, they give you a lot of this stuff, right? They give you, here's how you run it. Here's, you know, you get a whole book. Maybe you get a training class if you're, you know, buy a McDonald's or you get into Chick-fil-A or, you know, something like that. Like I know that you, they send you to like, you know, McDonald's university and you learn how to run the show and whatnot. But you you start out being a contractor like you don't you don't get that there is no book because most likely the guy you're working for doesn't have a business plan either so it's out to the wolves and i think that's that's great info of like figuring out what's important to you so you can establish what your business will actually look like and so where where this all kind of you know you're working through it you're figuring it out so how what i what screamed out about this little franchise remediation company that drew you to it yeah so um every most franchises will have you in for a discovery day if they want to um bring you into the brand and i went down and experienced the home office uh, learned more about the brand what it had to offer the operations what it would look like for me um you know and the culture there was you know, obvious. It was a family. You know, the people in the home office were were tight, and you had access to all of them. Um, you know, there's a sense of community, accountability, uh, respect, uh, excellence, and service, and those things really flowed through. And that, when you validate, you also um, talk to other owners in the network. Um, when you're buying a franchise, they have to give you that information, mm -hmm. and you can either take their um, their suggestions, because there are always a, a good list of people that are going to say good things about the brand. And then you can just start randomly calling people and like, hey, um, I'm thinking about buying this franchise and, you know, what's your experience? Mm -hmm. And I got some mixed results, but mostly good. And my my time during Discovery Day was good. Like I said, the culture there, um, culture is king. And if if you're not setting your culture in your business, someone else is. And if you have other employees, if you're not setting an intentional culture, uh, someone in your business mm -hmm. is creating that culture. And you don't want to leave that to chance. No. So we found, no, yeah, and we found that, that this was a, a, a good family brand for us. And that's why we dove in and um, pulled the trigger on it. Things changed. Um, 
later on, and we can get into that uh, a little bit if you'd like. But you know, at the time, it, it was it was a great decision, and we were happy to be there. Yeah, no, let's okay. So everything looked great on the surface, right? You made the phone calls; it it, it aligns with what you want. I'm sure that with it, once again being it's a franchise model, there's probably some sort of business plan attached to it, company vision, mission, statement. All, you get all that stuff with it, right? It takes all of that thinking out of it, and you're kind of handed the the playbook, essentially. So you have all of that, and, and you're, you're obviously liking what you see. So as you're working within this company, what, what starts happening? Because you initially loved it and now you're out on your own at, with reliable medi- remediation. So what would like take us through that, right? How did it start deteriorating to where you were like, mm, I don't know. Well, yeah. So, um, I, I immediately, you know, just dove right in, was vocal within the owner network, um, which the owner network was fantastic. They were always supportive. I remember within my first couple of months, I put in, you know, the owner's kind of forum. I said, hey, I'm looking for some help on, uh, you know, an operations manual, something with employees. And one of the franchisees had paid an outside company to do one for his business. And he's just sent it to me for nothing. Um, So the the network was really great for support. Mm -hmm. Um, And after a year in the brand, uh, we were bought by a larger franchisor. The founder and CEO had been at it for almost 25 years and he had put in his time and he had got um, the brand as far as he could take it, he felt, and he sold. You know, time to cash in. That's what we, most of us hope to do with our business. Um, Mm -hmm. If not have it be a legacy, then to be able to sell it at a great multiple. And he sold it to a larger franchisor, which is not uncommon. Um, And they were they have other businesses within home services and that first year things were okay uh there was definitely uh, some difficulty in transition we lost a lot of our home team a lot of those people who i kind of bought into and i don't know for lack of a better term fell in love with my you know when i did Mm -hmm. my discovery day with the with the home office and after that first year with the new franchisor, that company was bought by a larger franchisor looking to divest their their uh, holdings with um, companies in home services. And so now we've got layers and layers of bureaucracy going on. And many people who go into business for themselves leave the corporate world for a reason. They yes. hated it. And this had a more corporate feel to it. And mm. um, I served on the Franchise <clears throat> Advisory Council and um, which is kind of like an ombudsman between the ownership group and the franchisor okay. helping to deal with issues um having uh, ideas for you know the future of the brand etc and we had our third president in two years um and things were kind of feeling like they weren't staying together uh, we were getting less marketing help from our home office and they were pushing it out onto vendors instead of helping us at the home office. They said, well, you can hire this vendor instead. But we were already paying a certain amount, uh, percentage in royalties, a percentage of revenue that we were getting for free before. And now we're still paying that same amount and now having to pay for vendors on top of it. So there were a lot of different things going on. Mm -hmm, And like mm -hmm. I said, the culture changed a little. And um, I'm not one to... I'm going to be the squeaky wheel. And so I would say, hey, um, how can we make this better? What can we do to, you know, move this forward? And if I didn't kind of get the response I wanted, I'd take it up the level to the next person on the totem pole. And before long, it was all over a period of six to eight months. I was out of our brand, into the franchise or all the way up to, you know, the CEO of the head franchising company. Um, And that got some heads turned and brought me some attention. (laughs) Um, And I was, I was approached and said, it seems like you're not happy. Maybe you should just leave. Um, And we're going to offer you mutual termination. And I said, well, that wasn't really 
what I was looking for. I mean, literally my first year I won the brand champion award. It's still sitting here, you know, for helping develop the, okay. the reputation of the brand. Um, I, I was in, I drank the Kool-Aid and I was really trying to help improve. And they just thought I was a crank and I was struggling revenue wise. I had plateaued over, um, four years and having difficulty growing. Um, and they use that as an opportunity to say, well, maybe, maybe it's not for you. And I said, well, okay. But there was a non-compete clause in that mutual termination agreement, and I negotiated that out. Mm. And um, here I am on my own. And one of the things that I found now that I'm on my own, one of the things I found that's that had been holding me back was the franchise's website, which wasn't performing well online mm. because I have – I don't know, by a factor of 10 or higher, improve the amount of traffic I get to my business just by having my own website and being able to control the content. So there's a lot there. We can unpack whatever you want. Uh, well, I, let's stay on the values thing. I, I love sure. hearing that the website matters, folks, that get a website. Okay. It's 2022. You should have had a website if you've been doing this long enough since like 1990. And I know some of you out there have been doing this since 1990. So get a website and they do matter. Get a Google My Business. And that'll be one of the fastest ways to help market it, grow it. And that's what we're going to say on on web advertising for now. Um, what was the... I, I think this is where a lot of a lot of guys and gals in contracting end up, right? Is that you, you were the outspoken one that's mm, difficult to work with even you weren't trying to be i get it right like you you're like hey i i really liked this thing can we make it better because i don't feel like it's better you're kind of making it worse and i'm not getting the help i need and i'm paying for all this stuff and you're not delivering on your promises and i just want growth opportunities and and, and that right there i think is the biggest thing is growth opportunities especially with contractors is not a, not a lot, very few have set out plans of how you can move forward in a company. How do I get from apprentice to journeyman to foreman to inside sales to, you know, being some kind of manager on the, it's not there. So there's no growth potential. I'm stuck being your guy that mixes something and hands you a trowel a couple times a day. And you never let me set tile. You never tell me how to set it. You don't teach me how to use the saw. Like, it sucks. It's not a cool situation to be in. And so you were raising all of this saying like, hey, I want help. And they just no, like you don't fit the mold because you're not you didn't drink enough of the Kool-Aid and you're you're not falling for our scheme like you need to go away. And so you went away. But what was that the start of that journey like? Like you you bought into this culture so much that this journey of opening reliable remediation how did that play a factor into it being formed and, and moving forward? Sure. So, I mean, I drank the Kool-Aid. They just changed the flavor. Uh, I mean, I like the old flavor, you know? <laughs> um, that's kind of how that worked. Uh, I, um, I I think what a lot of contractors get stuck in is uh, they they don't have a growth mindset. A lot of them yes. just are happy having a job and enough work for the next few weeks. And they're okay just being solopreneurs. Like they don't want to grow it into this asset. And they, I don't understand that mindset, but I know plenty of contractors who are that way. Um, and then maybe are stuck there not knowing how to get to that next step. And even though I knew that I wanted my business to be an asset that I could grow and scale, I didn't know how to do it. And mm -hmm. so a year ago, I ended up hiring a business coach who, um, is kind of under the philosophy Mike Michalowicz, Profit First, Pumpkin Plan, um, these books that I don't know if your listeners are familiar with, but they're yep. great. I get the audio books and I listen to them in the truck when I'm driving around. Um, my pumpkin planning coach helped me kind of break down the culture that I was going to have because your culture, your core values, they, it comes from you. It's about who you are as an individual and as a business owner. Mm -hmm. um, and Mike McCallowitz says he makes them your immutable laws, right? Because laws have like 
it's a heavier term. Yeah. And uh, we were talking earlier that about rugby. I played rugby for a couple of years and rugby has laws. They don't have rules. There's no rules in rugby. There are laws because laws are not broken. <laughs> you can bend rules, right? But laws, not so much. And so Mike McAlloway does the same thing with Pumpkin Plan. And we sat down and started figuring out what our immutable laws were. And the way you figure that out is, did something frustrate you or anger you in the last week? If it did, it probably broke one of your immutable laws. And so those are the things that you need to focus to to understand what they are, identify them, and then focus on and build on. You know, for us, it was like, say what you mean, mean what you say, right? Have accountability, no excuses, mm-hmm. own own your mistakes, own your, own your BS, um, get better every day. Uh, identify solutions, not problems, you know, under promise over deliver. These were the things that we said, these are what our immutable laws are. And this is what we're going to build our brand on. This is going to be our culture. And right now it's mostly family. My boys work with me and we sit and we talk about them. You know, Mm -hmm. how are these things coming out in our marketing message? Um, This has overlap into the vendors we work with. This has overlap into the clients that we attract because our ideal clients share some of these immutable laws. Why? Because they find the same things important that I find important. You know, I'm anal about communication. If I get an email and I'm in the middle of a job and I know it's from a client, it, it kills me not responding. But I know that... Like that's just it's just who I am. I know it can wait four mm-hmm. hours. Nobody like if I get back to them within twenty four hours. I, in our sphere with contractors, if if I get back to them <laughs> at all, they're gonna be amazed. Like guys, return your phone calls, please. Gals, return your phone calls. Yes. No, but, preach it, preach it. <laughs> it's just how I am. So I, you know, if I get a text, I want to. I just want to be on top of it. Why? Because I know not everybody has that same obsessive compulsive disorder that I have. So when I send an email and I get an answer within 24 hours, like I give people slack. I'm like, I don't expect them to reply within the hour because I know not everybody's as crazy as I am. But I just, I want people to feel like they're important. Mm -hmm. So the quicker I can get back to them and give them an answer or find a solution or get it on the calendar, whatever I can do to build that relationship with that client. uh, Because if they're like me, they will... They will just latch onto that and they'll be a client for life if I can follow through on it. Yes. And so that's what's important to me. Um, and, you know, those, so those are some of our immutable laws and that's how we build our culture. I, I, that's, it's, it's wonderful. I have the same problem. I've worked very hard to get myself. Like I got an email last night and got a deposit and I was like, it's after six, it's after six o'clock. I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to ignore it. I'll get back to him later. I saw it before we started recording and I was like, ooh, I got like two minutes. I bet you I could get an email out and print out the stuff and make my notes and and file it away. And I was like, nope, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it. Like I'm working real hard not to because I've, I, I struggled. Like it's, it's a boundary thing. And if you constantly respond, which is great because you're right. Most contractors are like, they don't get back to you. They're not reliable. They're not timely about things. And so it's really easy to look good when, you provide that service. However, if you're responding at all hours of the night, now they think they can reach you at all hours of the night. And I, I've, I needed to learn to shut down at some point. So there needs to be boundaries, but yeah, communication is, is huge. And having that is like, uh, being able to identify that and people that appreciate it and respect it. it yeah. A hundred percent be able to find that ideal client that, is looking for that because there's probably people that don't mind someone being flaky, right? But are they willing to pay top dollar? Most likely not. And so I like those top dollar clients. I'm okay with them being a, a quote unquote Karen. I can deal with that. I have things in place to communicate and hold their hand and make them feel special so that they're not a Karen with me. And that's, it works out very well. But uh, so I, you have these laws and you're, you're talking about them with your sons who are part of the company. I, I think that's, that's huge. One of the things that I know is 
I, I think I worked for a, a couple of larger companies at one point and you know you're given the employee handbook and and maybe it mentions something about vision mission values in there you you sign it they file it away you get your copy you throw it in the trash when you get home and that's that but the fact that you're talking about it actively and how do we identify this how do we keep it alive how do we demonstrate it how do we find it in our in our clients is i think what's making the difference for your company. And so how did that, did that become a thing because you made it a thing? Did you know it needed to be a thing or did it just happen naturally as the business is growing that you're talking about, you know, your values and your immutable laws? I guess for me, it, it was easier because they're my sons and I'm always trying to be instructional. Okay. Um, so it's easier to kind of bring the, bring up the topic and say, this is how you want to handle a situation like this. Um, now I should be right now. I mean, we've had other employees at the moment. We don't, but it's always been an opportunity to say, um, Hey, this is how we want to handle this with the client. When the client asks us, a question this is the kind of answer we want to give them and this is why uh, because it's important that they understand the process that they stay in the loop and um, that they don't feel left out of it you know they're a lot of times we're dealing with insurance carriers and they can be as hard to get a hold of as some contractors too mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I mean one of the other things that didn't make the list is you know don't answer unasked questions like don't get too deep in the weeds don't start explaining 75 things um, I had that happen, and um, it, we had a learning experience. We were we were called out to do an air duct cleaning for um, a guy, and his air ducts were clean. And he was complaining that particles were coming out of him, and you know he couldn't sleep because it's actually clean right now. And if I clean it, he's never going to stop calling me because I know there's nothing in here. Mm-hmm. Um, and we went through the system, we went through everything and my guy was putting everything back together and he, he brought up a couple of details. Hey, we did this. Hey, we did this. We did this. And I said, you never should have said that. Um, because he didn't ask like, and I swear we were 10 minutes away from the job after leaving and he called and said, Hey, your guy said this, can you come back? Cause it's not working anymore. So that was a lesson. I said, see, I told you. <laughs> and at least it wasn't a bad thing. We yeah. turned around, you know, we lost another 30 minutes. I mean, it was already not a job. So we had already lost production for the day. But it is what it is. At least we, you know, didn't give the customer anything they didn't need. Mm-hmm. He was satisfied that we handled everything. You know, we got everything back together. He just, he heard what he wanted to hear because we answered a question that wasn't asked. And, you know, it causes an extra trip back. Yes. So, yeah, stop with the with the high tech, you know, industry lingo. And if they don't ask, don't give an answer. I I, I love it. That's that's great info. Uh, you, you mentioned that. So you're not talking about the values with other employees. I mean, you are, but like not deeply. So if if you went and asked one of them, like they couldn't recite what they are. Um, well, like I said, right now it's only my sons. We lost um, an employee a year ago. He, you know, we helped um, build him up, and he mm-hmm. found a better job, and um, we're really happy for him. It helped him buy a house. We were at a Labor Day party for them recently. Um, you know, still great friends with the family. Um, during COVID, his family didn't want him around because we were still working at people's homes, like his extended family. Mm-hmm. And so his immediate family came to my house for Thanksgiving, uh, you know, in 2020, because we spent more time together than we did with our own immediate families. I'm like, yeah. if we're going to get anybody sick, we're going to get each other sick. So we, um, it was a great opportunity. And we did talk about those things. Like It was, um, but right now it's just me and my sons okay. and we do find opportunities to talk about them but no we want to talk about mission we want to talk about vision because it has to be an important part of what we're doing and when people understand why we do stuff it's easier for them to do it you know it's you're not like just do this because that's how we do it or i said so yes I, that doesn't work you know if they understand the why behind it it, it goes so much farther 
one, it usually makes our life easier because we're doing it for a reason. Or, or two, it's because we understand the client's needs and we know what's important to them. And by doing it in this way, it makes our life easier in the long run. They're not standing over our shoulder watching the work we do because we've explained it. We've shown them. After we finish, we come back. We show them again. This is what we said we were going to do. And you know, if you're in somebody's house for an extended period of time, we all have those clients, right? That just, they don't go away. They watch us work all day. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I know we've all had them, but these are, these are the opportunities to put them at ease um, because of the way we, th we do things. And it's because of the culture and the, the air we put forward yeah. to show how we do our job. You know, that's, that's a big thing. I see guys and gals complain about all the time. Oh, the homeowner's watching me, man. What do you care? Like they hired you to do a job that they, they're curious. Most of the time, they honestly, they're just curious. They, they've never seen it before. They just want to see what's going on. Oh, it makes me nervous. Why you do this every day? Like what's the, you know, this is your thing. Just as long as you're not cutting a corner, what's, what's, there's no harm and they'll probably leave. So they'll get bored. If not, and, you know, hey, charge, tell them it's extra, right? Go at, at, you know, bring a bag of popcorn the next day, make a joke out of it. Be like, you need a treat. <laughs> right. Or Have it's fun. the, um, you know, it's a little extra if you watch, it's double the price if you help. And, you know, I've seen Correct. signs like that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I but, don't you know, really be rude. Corners. But... <laughs> but, I, yeah, but it, it's a joke. It's a joke within the industry and within the trades. The, um, the thing, the thing that I think people need to remember is like, if guys want to cut corners, there's cameras everywhere, man. Um, oh, you just, gosh. you need to, you need to cut that habit right now. You've really got to get that under control. There's cameras and audio everywhere these days. If, if you are in a house and you don't think you're being recorded, think again. Just assume you are because be there's probably some device somewhere. So just assume you are. And you honestly, as a professional, you should be behaving that way anyways it's not your house so you should be respecting it but yeah I, there, there's a company value be just be respectful like treat it as if it was grandma's house right you're not going to go in grandma's house and cheat grandma come on really yeah and there's other things that guys can do I, especially in the contracting sphere one of the things that we do because we're always showing up and doing dirty jobs you know just wearing shoe covers putting down floor protection at the door so that you're not you know, messing up a carpet and have to clean it later. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. lot of things you can do that shows respect for your client's property that starts to build the culture with your team too, because that's already in the forefront of their mind. Oh, I got to go run back to the truck and get some booties. My feet are wet. Or, you know, I just thinking of those things, you mm -hmm. know, that, mm -hmm. bit, that that's a great culture thing. And it's so cheap to do. For sure. It's one of those things, you know, I've heard of, um, Companies getting compliments from their clients because the guys never once cut across the lawn. They would walk down the sidewalk to the driveway, from the driveway over to the truck, right? And so, yeah, it's it's easier to go straight across, but it, it's the little things that you can instill within your company that are going to make the huge difference overall. Everyone thinks they're going to, you know, implement some kind of big change and it, it's going to be amazing and it, it's little things like hey guys can you just be respectful you know put on the booties that we provide you know make sure uh i was just listening to some other show and the guy provides um button ups for his electricians and he's had to set a rule like you can only unbutton it to this button and that's it if like <laughs> there is no other way to to do this where this isn't like some 70s like disco place right like it can go down to the second button and, and that's it. Like that's all you get. And so it's, it's little things that just uh, appearance and, and trying to be respectful, I think go just a really long way of being in someone's house. They, they let you in and they're paying you to be there. So I, man, you know, it, it blows you my know, mind sometimes what goes on in important. people's head and culture. Go ahead. And I think it's important to, to um, think about the rules too and ask your team about the rules and how it really plays out. It, when you were just telling that story, it made me think of, I, I don't know why, a story my dad told me decades ago. He used to 
be a driver for a um, major soft drink distributor. And he would have a T-shirt on under his button-up shirt, and he'd be, you know, hustling crates and getting them all onto the fort, you know, the 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 hand truck and getting ready to bring in. And while he was doing that, he always had his uniform shirt off, but he had a T-shirt on. And then before he went into the store, he would put the uniform shirt on because he didn't want to get all sweaty and gross. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. then his supervisor was like, "No, you have to have that on all the time." It's like, but if I had it off, then it, it's going to be all sweaty and disgusting. I'm going to stink. So think about the rules, right? Like talk to your teams, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. see if they make sense. And I see both sides on that one. I'm just saying he was trying to go above and beyond and his supervisor's like, nope, this is what you're going to do. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that's that's huge, right? Within the this this culture talk that we're having is that I don't know that a lot of times people will go and get the feedback from their team. It's there. Once again, it comes down to that standard trade idea of I've been doing it 20 years. Okay. And if you're not innovating, you're dying. If, if you're not trying to change something and you're, you're sticking to the same old way, you're, you're not moving forward. Your company's dying. And so if your employees are, you know, 18 to 28 years old and the average age of an installer in the floor covering industry is like 55 plus there's there's a bit of a generation gap you may want to find out what's like hip these days and and consider it just maybe maybe consider it like it's it it's probably a good idea and i I think that's having those open talks and and letting them know that they're valued and that their their feedback is appreciated because how often have you worked somewhere that you ex- well, I mean, take the working for the franchise, right? Being part of the franchise system, you were expressing an opinion, and it was more of no, 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 we don't want to hear it. Instead of oh, is that really a problem? Do others feel this way? Are you expressing this for a lot of like there? There was no, there wasn't the follow up, and so then that frustrated you more, which made you ask more questions, which frustrated them more, and instead of having an open conversation to build a better environment that everyone can be happy and successful in. Now you're, now you're their competition and you're probably, like you said, you're getting your, 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 your traffic's way up. You're probably doing more revenue than you were before. So how good is that for them? Right. They, they could have had you on their side and uh, instead they said, no, 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 it, it's okay. You can go away. And that's what happens. That's why you're always hiring somebody. That's why you can't keep, a young kid like you're not open to the change and something different stop please <laughs> stop i yeah you're preaching and i'm the choir here for no <laughs> doubt about it um and i think w- when you build your culture with your team it also it spills over like i was saying before into the type of vendors you work with the subcontractors mm-hmm. you work with because they'll have to share those same values because uh, if you don't eventually it's going to come to a head and something maybe really bad could happen because you disagree on how it should be dealt with a client or a different job um, and if you do, if you don't share those values it, it makes a big difference it also helps us seek out our ideal clients mm-hmm. like obviously you think in our position anybody with a flooded basement i i don't really mm-hmm. just want anybody with a flooded basement um i really want somebody who you know values communication you know maybe somebody who supports local business you know maybe they love that i'm not a franchise anymore right maybe they love that i'm family owned and operated um you know they want a superior customer experience mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. they don't just want whoever the insurance company recommends to come in and do the work. So this helps us identify a lot of things and it shapes our marketing message because now that's shaped all the copy on my website and it, it shapes the videos I do to put out on social media. So everything we do, culture reaches all of those places and helps us shape our entire business. So if you don't have a grip on it, um, you need to get a grip on it. <laughs> well, you're all over the place. You're you're one way with one client, another with another client. The next month you're running a business this way. Two two months later, it's a different way. It, it, you're right. Consistency matters. So if you don't have, once again, like 
you you received that franchise and you were given the the playbook right everything was written down it was it was laid out and now you've had to develop that on your own but you knew that it needed to be developed and what once again these contractors as the as the solopreneurs you know maybe they have one guy or maybe they run a second crew it's it's all very like, hey, look, hey man, you're gonna go over here. You're gonna work on this, and there's there's nothing else to it. It's there's no scaling it. There's no growing it. There's no communication. There's no anything behind it. And that's that's what we're talking about. Is like you you've got to have at your core these these few things to be able to identify how your company operates so you can share that and, and bond around it. So I want to get into talking about subcontractors, but I'm going to interrupt, interrupt us for just a second here. Folks, it's time to make your plans to travel to Las Vegas with me to hit the show floor at the International Surface event. Our sponsor, Tice, has provided me with an incredible offer for my listeners. You can now register for a free exhibits pass with code Kyle, that's K-Y-L-E for those who can't spell my name. Registration is open online at www.intlsurfaceevent.com forward slash register. It's all happening in Las Vegas the 31st of January through the 2nd of February, 2023. Plus, don't miss the special podcast episode this December, which will give you the inside scoop on what's happening at the event. Homeowner tenure is at an eight-year low, with the average length of ownership being 6.31 years. During ongoing times of building material supply constraints, does a 25-year or lifetime warranty on your materials really mean anything? John's Manville Go Board offers a limited 10-year manufacturer warranty on all its products and a list of approved alternative products covered under our warranty. Don't hold your job up because you can't piece together a full system. Visit www.jm.com forward slash go board for more information. All right, Russ, you run a remediation company. There's got to be subcontractors involved. Once you kind of come in, you get stuff dried out. Um, So contractors are difficult, man. And, and being one, like just trying to find someone else to to work with you on your time frame, the way you run your your business, right? Like that that stuff's always mattered to me. Having those identical values. I I don't want to just put anyone in my client's house. I want to make sure I put the right person in my client's house, and, and they get the job done right to standards that I would I would have. So what has, you know, you, you mentioned your vendors too, being able to, you know, go and purchase products from people you like, how is all of that tied into your values and how are you going to these companies and identifying that they, they line up with you? So it's interesting. And in our industry, there are a lot of what people would call full service restoration contractors. They'll handle the construction end and everything else. Mm -hmm. And the fact is a lot of those guys are subbing out a lot of that work. They don't have painters and sheet rockers and tapers and everything on their, on their salary or on their payroll. They sub it. And mm-hmm. the, the, the margins are so tight on the reconstruction side that having to mark it up can make it more expensive for my clients. And we just stick to the mitigation side. And then I'll make ref- Referrals. Mm -hmm. I'll say, listen, here are a few names of people that I know and trust, see what their schedules are like. Or maybe you know somebody that you know, like, and trust. Um, And so I can help them with that process. And it saves me the problem of having to have a contractor walk in there that is on my name and it's up to them whether I look good or bad. And they're going to be the last thing they see about my company. And I I want me to be the lasting impression and my company not, you know, oh, whatever happens. I mean, things happen. We Mm -hmm, know. And mm -hmm. sometimes it just doesn't get handled right. Like it's just a, it's life. No, the order didn't come in on time. Now we've got to get it kicked down. You know, the schedule gets messed up. That's usually what happens in these situations, right? It never happens on the right timeline. And so we've avoided that by just not subbing it out. That means we don't make money on that, you know, overhead um, or, you know, being a GC for those things. 
but I just move on to the next one and let them take that job. And let's, our stuff's not cheap anyway. The mm-hmm. mitigation side is pretty costly, um, and the pro- the margins are pretty good. So I don't even want to dabble in it. And you know, it's funny because I tried to meet a few plumbers. Plumbers are great referral partners for us. Mm-hmm. And one guy's like, you know, I don't do any of that stuff. I would rather work as a sub for a GC and just do installs and not have to deal with customers. So I was like, oh. All right. Well, we're not going to be great referral partners then, but Mm -hmm. that's cool. And he's doing what he wants to do. Um, So figuring that out and having those conversations, even if you are, if I was working with subs, it would have to be having those conversations with them saying, you know, what's important? How are you running your business? Do we want to be associated together? And can we, how are we going to, how are we going to deal with adversity when it comes? Because it's going to come. Uh, and I think that's an important conversation to have up front. That's no amazing advice. You know, I think it's it's awesome that you're trying to find out what they're what they're doing, because if a guy doesn't do commercial work and you're trying to get him to go do commercial work, like it, it's not a good fit. So this plumber straight up told you, like, nah, I don't like dealing with homeowners. I just want to do new construction and install some stuff. And off I go. Like, you, you know, at, for me. I like residential remodel work. I don't like working with general contractors. I want to deal directly with the homeowner. There's generally no other trades involved. It it makes life very easy for me because I can control everything. And at the end of the day, like I understand that's one of my shortcomings is I want to have control. So I don't want it to be up to somebody else and the schedule gets messed up on their side. Like if I you know, have the material and I say, I'm going to install for five days. I'm going to install for five days. Your project will be completed and I get to move on. So it's, I, I like that you've kind of like, right. You niched into the same thing. You're like, no, nope, I'm just going to handle the remediation part. And then here's some phone numbers. And if you want to call them, you can call them. Otherwise, like you're on your own. I, di- I did my part and insurance work can get nasty anyways. And then, like you said, you get into that stuff and the margins are low. And if you're if you're on razor thin margins and you're trying to sub out work, anything can destroy that. You're going to how quickly can you end up in the red and then what's it going to take to get out of it? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's that's the problem with that. And and I still follow up with my customers and my referral partners. And I say Mm -hmm. how to go with them, because if you don't have that opportunity to have that talk and say, oh, it wasn't a great fit. Maybe your referral partner is like, I didn't really, I didn't want to work with that guy, or I worked with that guy and it didn't work out, and here's why. It helps you make better decisions and better referrals down the road. So mm-hmm. have that conversation with people. Have the same conversation with, you know, your your clients, because, you know, for me, they could have another flood next next year, and I want them to call me back. And if I follow up with them and say, Hey, how did it go with, you know, ABC Construction? Did you know was it good? You know, it was good. Yeah, thanks for giving them. That was a great name. I appreciate it. Or, yeah, it was okay. Or, well, tell me what happened. And you can learn more about making that referral um, better down the road. And you can even go back to your referral partner and say, hey, we have a good relationship. I do refer you. Here's the feedback I got. And then, of course, there's three sides to every story. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, get filled in and get figured out whether or not you can still because you give a piece of yourself with every referral. You give a piece of your name and your reputation with every referral. So it, it's not quite as bad as if you were subbing it and it was under your business name, but it's it's up there, right? So you have to take time to nurture that relationship with both the client and then your referral partner to make sure um, those things are being done to a standard that everyone's happy with. That's... Uh, yes, I, I think that follow up piece is key, and I don't know that there's a lot of contractors that do it. They're not checking back in three weeks down the road, six weeks down the road, six months down the road. One, how are you staying in front of your old clientele and top of mind? But two, it, it doesn't hurt. Like no one's going to get offended about you asking for feedback on what your service experience was like. And, and so maybe some people won't be completely honest with you. So may, develop a a survey that's anonymous, right? And you can just kind of send it out at the end and, and you get feedback and, you know, they can fill it out in a month or six months or whenever they have time. But I, I think that's, that's great advice because you, how do you, 
keep a, a check on your culture if you're not getting that feedback from an outside perspective, right? Like you and your sons can think you're doing the greatest job in the world. And, and the, you know, all of you are like, yeah, man, we're killing it. But then you call the client up and they're like, you know, I just, I really wasn't happy with the service. You kind of did this thing or that thing. And I didn't like that experience. And that'll, you're keep once again, like you're just keeping a pulse on it and keeping it at the forefront of this is what the company represents. And I want that to be shown in the community. And I think that there's another lacking area is people don't, they, they, they only want for their business. And I think businesses are built, you build the business to serve the community. It's not about you anymore. You built a business to go change something in your community because there was something you didn't like about it. And so you can want all you want, but what are you doing to, to give back or help them as the community? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, I've learned this process through pumpkin planning my business and working with my business coach because one of the things you do is you interview your ideal clients and you ask a list of questions about things you did well, things you could do better, what is it that makes us stand out. Um, and this can be part of that process. And this is not something you do once. This is something you do um, continually through the life of your business. So having those opportunities to actually have a conversation, um, some I did on Zoom, some I did, I said, hey, let me take you to lunch. Um, you know, it's okay on the phone, but you, it's really great to be able to have those visual cues when you're having a conversation with someone. So taking that time to talk to some of your clients and getting that information and that feedback is key. It doesn't have to be you know, all hundred clients you had this year, mm -hmm. you know, pick the top 10% and go back to them and say, how do we clone these clients? And by getting feedback from them about what you did well and what you can improve on um, and what drew, drew them to you and your business um, and your culture that you've developed will help you continue mm -hmm. to grow moving forward. Well, those, those clients have a culture. Um, I was in one of my mastermind groups last night. We, we got to talking about ideal clients and whatnot. And the, the discussion came up of, well, are you asking them about their friends? How are you getting in front of them? Because we generally hang out with like-minded people. And so if your ideal client fits a certain you know stereotype or you've built this avatar around that, then most likely their friends will fit that avatar. So instead of trying to find a way to advertise to an entire community, you've now narrowed in on, I have this client, I, I can interview them and get feedback from them. And then how do I make sure they really, really love me? And that Susie goes and tells Jill and Jill tells Sandy. And now I, I'm just staying busy within this group because they're all very similar. And most likely they're an ideal client because they ha they hung out as a, as a group with each other. And so you're, it's not just your culture that matters. It's knowing the culture of your clients as well. And they should probably line up. That's why you did business in the first place. But I, I think being able to focus in on that, hone in on what matters to these people, what do they look like and how do I extract that out of them so that we can, you know, I have something to grow, but what can I give them so that they're getting the experience they want? Yeah, I, I'm, and that's why you need to shape your culture within your business and you have to do it intentionally um, because then it's going to shape your marketing message that will help you attract those um, ideal clients because they're going to share some of those same values with you and your message will ring true to them just like if you were reading it and you go oh yeah I want to do business with this company because these are things that are important to me too mm -hmm. um, that's it's just you can't leave it to chance I think is the most important thing and um, by being intentional and going at it uh, you can help your business grow and be a happy place. You don't want it to be a toxic place. We know plenty of work sites that suck. <laughs> We've all worked on them, right? <laughs> and I mean, you could still break each other's chops. You could give people a hard time. That can be done in, you know, fun and mm -hmm, fairness. Mm -hmm. um, that's okay. But there's got, it's got to be a safe place too. And building a culture where people are happy and want to come to work 
it comes out they're more productive they are better with clients they're you're, they're the face of your business so when they're happy and they mm-hmm. buy into your culture they become a players and you don't have to control it anymore that's it. well yeah and i don't want to have to put effort into that i want them to man i really like coming to work and then what you know if we're going to talk about empl- um clients having friends with the same values and whatnot if you can hire employees that match your value system once again they probably hang out with people that have the same value system if they like coming to work man i like working with my friends way more than i like working with random strangers that i may or may not get along with and then develop other issues with and so if i can find a way to get my buddy to work with me because i really like where i work that's a much better situation than who knows who Russ is hiring this week and will I get along with them? Now, granted, if you're using values to interview people and uh, go back and listen to my episode with, with Aaron Albrecht, where we do a mock, it's uh, I think I just call it like mock interview or mock employee interview. And we run through how she interviews people for her company, JNR tile, but the, the values and finding a growth mindset in people were, are super, apparent in her interview process and their employees seem to click much faster with each other than other companies that I see that we talked about, right? Like I just need a, I think we were talking about it before we started, but like a lot of contractors just hire that warm body. I just need to get somebody in here that can do this thing as opposed to finding the right person to do the thing that's going to want to stick around and grow and hopefully become a journeyman at some point. Yeah, and I think we've all held jobs. We haven't always been business owners, most of us, right? So remember the job where you worked through with somebody who sucked and you ended up picking up extra hours because they didn't do their job or you had to do a job again because they did it wrong? There's nothing that makes a place worse to work at than some C or D player who can't do it or doesn't fit like they they may be a great tradesman but maybe they don't fit your culture maybe they just look at things differently maybe they're just there it's okay they could be an a player somewhere else Mm -hmm. but they're not an a player in your organization that's okay it's not personal but this is the organization we have this is our culture and ask your team, ask your team leader, ask your foreman, right? Hey, how are things working out? Make them part of the interview process. Let them have a say in who comes on board. And you're right. Um, good referrals are often you know, buddies or maybe a cousin or somebody else because there's already a connection. And if your A player's cousin comes on and you're, that cousin is a B or a C player, he – that guy, your guy is going to try to get him up to speed or he's going to be the first one to say he needs to go because he's making me look bad. And yes. that's the culture you want to develop. Yes, 100% agree. It, it, when you, It's the same thing with referrals really, that you mentioned, right? Like, I'm putting my name out there for you. I'm vouching for you. Don't make me look bad because this will be the last one you get. And especially if I try and get you hired, man... I'll go out on a limb one time for you and that's it. It don't screw it up. And I, I've, I've had friends that like I've, I've tried to get jobs and they screwed it up and then I'm somewhere else. And they're like, Hey man, I need, Nope. I tried, dude, you screwed it up over here. Never again. You, you done, you burnt that bridge and I'm not dealing with it. And they're just like, Oh, okay. I understand. Don't be a flake, dude. Like it's not hard. Do, do what you say you're going to do as a contractor too. Do what you say you're going to do. If you, uh, yeah, we're getting uh, on a tangent. Uh, oh my gosh, <laughs> I, there's so many things. Look, I got go check out my Facebook reels. I'm releasing like one a day right now with little quick snippets and stuff. Like, just do what you say you're gonna do. I'm not gonna go down that road right now. I don't want to get on that soapbox. Um, Russ, any anything we didn't cover that you think is like super important that we should mention? No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, to reiterate, be intentional about your culture, you know, let it affect who you bring on board. Um, it's not just you and your client, it's your team and your client. You know, when you start to realize um, kind of how broad culture is, 
I, I think your eyes get opened into how much it influences. And so, you know, be, be open to it mm-hmm. um, and really just figure out what's important to you. What are your immutable laws? What frustrated you last week? What, what law did that break? And, you know, uh, start being intentional. I love it. All right. Where can people find you? Where if, if anyone wants to reach out, what what else what are the kind of things you got going on? You know, get your let's get your quick plugs in here. Sure. So um we're at you know www.reliableremediation.com. Um, you know, we're on YouTube, Facebook, we try to do a lot in social media and education within the industry. We were even on TikTok at Reliable Remediation. I mean, I can't believe I'm saying that at my age, but here we are. Um we have a little um podcast for small businesses that we run. It's called It's Just Business and it's not industry specific. It's just business stuff, how to grow your business, scale your business, especially for startups in the first five years. And, um, you know, I, that's how we connected because mm-hmm. we both have podcasts. And so we love the abundance mindset. There's plenty of listeners out there and they need all the information they can get. I agree. Go back, go back a couple of weeks, listen in with, uh, with Dana about HR and she is the other half of the it's just business podcast and they've got they got great stuff going on over there with their interviews so keep keep applying it you got questions for Russ reach out um I'm sorry he's not looking for subs in Connecticut but uh maybe you could become a referral partner so that that's better in my opinion I that sub game is rough man I, I let me control my my part of it but once again that that's my shortcoming <laughs> Oh, all right, folks, that's going to do it for us this week on the Floor Academy podcast. Go check out FloorAcademyPod.com. I've got the business budget calculator over there. We've got the equipment tracker. There's the job cost analyzer. You can link to the Facebook group where you can join in the conversations and, and discuss business more throughout the week. Once again, patreon.com slash floor academy, even $5 a month goes a long way in helping me to continue to produce the content. Check out the YouTube uh, floor academy. Once again, on the website, go to the store, man. You can pick up a cool shirt. It's it's October now. So go ahead and oh no, hold on. I think this is October, November. I don't know when this episode's coming out. I'm sorry, folks, but uh, it's cold. Pick up a hoodie. Floor Academy hoodies are sweet. I promise I got a couple of them uh, and you'll look really good when you go to Vegas with me in, in January in February, it, you'll still need a hoodie in Vegas. I promise it's warm, but wear a hoodie and a floor Academy one. You'll look great. So that's all I got for this week. Thank you, Russ, for joining us. Thank you for your insights on culture and why it's important to you and how you use it to build your brand. And we will chat next week.